You should now have made your project proposal and your teacher should have agreed to your proposal by this point. Today we're going to be looking at the structure of the report and starting to set up our report. Before you jump into the code, it's important to create the analysis stage of our programme. This is where we first of all come up with a project definition. We justify our computational methods, investigate any potential solutions and think about our end user requirements. Please read pages 15 to 19 of the textbook. So now we're going to start actually creating your report. The best place to do this is in Microsoft Word or Google Docs. The first page should be a title page, but there's no credit for this. You need to include your full name, your candidate number, your centre name, centre number, project title, the course code, which is on the screen here, H446. And for the date, just leave that as the year that you're completing the project. For example, if you're completing it in 2022, you might put 2022 to 2023. If you're using Microsoft Word, it's useful to actually create styles and use these styles. This means when you're creating a list of contents, it will automatically do it for you. At the top, have a look for style and have a play with these. A good report will have a header and footer. This will include automatic page numbers, but it will also include information about your name, maybe the project title and any other information you think is important. Please add these now. To save you time from creating a table of contents, you can actually use an automatic table. You can get to that in Microsoft Word by going to the References section and adding the Auto Table Contents. Whenever you create a title though, you need to be using um, one of the styles that we talked about before. Next, I want you to read pages 20 and 21. Have a think about where you're going to be saving your work. You don't want it to get lost. You want it to be somewhere which is consistent that you can get to whether you're working at home or in school. I recommend using online storage. This way you don't need to back it up because you can have the latest version you're working on online. Anything that you use from the internet, whether that be code, text, images or video, all need to be referenced. And there's two different ways that you can actually do this. The first way is to use superscript. Now, when you're writing, you'd put a small number next to the quote. Remember, the quote would be in speech marks. You would then put a reference in the bottom of the page. This might include the name of the author, the year it was uh, published, and other information such as its location. The other option for referencing is using Harvard referencing. Now you might be familiar with Harvard referencing. This is where we have a reference in the middle of a block of text or a paragraph. You still need to use speech marks when you're referencing something. After the reference, directly after the reference, you'd put where the information is from. So quite often the book, or the website, the date it was published, the page number and the author. You should now have a fully set up document with headers and footers, with a contents table, a front page and all the other information that we've talked about. Remember the referencing that we've talked about previously in this last slide because it's important that you're doing that throughout the document. We're now going to turn to look at the first section of the project which is the analysis section. Here's the mark scheme for the analysis section of the project. You'll notice it is 10 marks and you want to be aiming for that top mark band. 9 to 10 marks. Now when you look at the wording of the mark band you'll notice there's only one or two words difference between the 9 to 10 marks and the 6 to 8 marks. These words inc include justify and explain. 
When you're working through this section of your project, it's really, really important that you are justifying what you're doing and explaining your answers. To give you an introduction to the first part of this, I want you to read pages 23 and 24. This will give you an idea of what a project definition should look like. So the project definition is the first impression of your project. This means you need to be really clear here. You need to present me with what your problem is or what your project definition is. And you can structure this in any way that you want. You're giving me an overview of what your project is actually going to be. What's the problem and what solution are you going to create? By reading this paragraph, I should have a clear understanding about what the rest of your project is going to be about and why you are tackling this project in the way that you are. Now, there doesn't need to be a lot of text with this section. It can be a couple of paragraphs. However, it needs to be really clear and really structured. If you get this part wrong, your project is not clear and the examiner will straight away be looking for holes in your project. So make sure this is clear. Here is an example of the project definition. You might want to look at this one as an alternative one. It's a, an example for a game. You can see again, it's only two paragraphs long, but from looking at it, we can very quickly pick up what the theme of the project is. You can see they're making a game similar to a Nintendo game called Duck Hunt. You know it's going to be a retro game, it's going to have moving targets, and it gives a little bit more information about the game, such as it being two player and how the points in life will work. It gives a very brief overview of what else is going to be included in the game. You need to make sure you've finished your project definition before you move on to this section. Section 2 should be the justification of the features that make your problem solvable by a computer or computational methods. Now this should be much more extended than the project definition. You need to be explaining why you'd need a computational method for a project. You need a new subheading for this. You need to think about what you might be talking in this section and why you might be doing that. Now, throughout 2.1, we looked at lots of different topics, including abstraction, decomposition, and then we did all the different topics, thinking logically, thinking ahead, etc. These are the kind of things that you might want to include in your project. There is an example on this slide, so you might want to pause it and have a look at this example. And at the bottom of the slide, there are some questions that you might consider including in your answer. But remember, this can be uh, for many different structures. It has to be your own format. Now, you can look at some of the example projects if you want to, to give you an idea of how they've gone about it, but please don't copy any other projects. Before you tackle this section, look at the top mark band. Remember we talked about those words, justify and explain, the only two words which are different. So while you're talking about the computational methods that you're going to be using, you need to be justifying why your solution would need a computational method and explain the reasons for that. Your programming can be not great. However, it can be quite easy to get 10 marks on the section if you have justified your answers. Here's an example. My game would be better on a computer because I need a scoreboard, which can be updated easily so that when a goal is scored, the process is quick. Now, first look at this, it sounds like quite a good answer. But on the bottom left hand corner, you can actually see a cricket scoreboard. Now, this scoreboard can be updated fairly simply by removing one of the numbers and replacing it with a different one. So when a goal is scored, this can be done instantly by somebody who stood there watching the match. This hasn't answered why we would need computational methods and why they would be better. 
you'd need to think about other advantages to the computational method of why a scoreboard would be an advantage. You could think about remote games, two-player games which are played across a network, so that both players can see the scoreboard wherever they are. You could talk about saving scoreboards on a computational method, but just remember you could save a picture of a scoreboard and that's not going to make it computational. So you need to be really, really clear about why your solution would be better with a computational method. When you're answering these sections, you need to also avoid generic advantages of computational methods. Here are two examples. It allows a user to play without the need for a second human. Or it removes the need for a physical chessboard. Well, yes, these are advantages of computational methods, but they are not justified. There's no justify, justification or explanation in these features. And if we look at an answer similar to this, we're looking at the bottom mark band. You'd need to fully justify why playing with an artificial intelligent system, if you, this is a chess system, would be better than playing against a person. What are the advantages? The kind of things you could talk about in this instance are the fact it can learn how good you are and match the game to make it challenging for you, but not too difficult that you have no chance of winning. You could also talk about how the game could be paused or played anywhere. So when you're sat on a train, you could have an electric um, chessboard. Or you could be playing two player games where each player has a version on their board, on their phones. And then justify why that would be good for them. Before you start this section, I recommend reading pages 24 of the book to describe the computational methods. When you've read that and you're happy with that, try to complete this section. And remember, it should be a couple of sides of A4, which are fully justified. Now, you should have finished your project definition and why your project is suitable as a computational system. The third section is looking at identify stakeholders. And again, there are multiple ways that you could actually do this in your project. I think this lends itself to its own section. However, it can be included in other sections if you feel that is appropriate. Let's look at the mark band again. For 9 to 10 marks, the words that are different are describe and explain. So describe is 6 to 8 marks and describe and explain is 9 to 10 marks. And there's only one word different here. But you should be thinking still about justifying your answers. So you need to identify suitable stakeholders for the project and describe and explain how they will make use of the proposed solution and why it's appropriate to their needs. So when choosing a stakeholder, you need to be really, really clear about who you're choosing and why. It needs to be in the target audience and it needs to be somebody who is actually going to be making use of this solution. Then you need to explain why that person is suitable. Try not to just use one person. Try to think about why you're selecting that person. If it's a game, is that person going to be in your age bracket? To help you with this, I want you to read pages 24 to 26 of the book. Once you've done that, you'll see an example on the screen. Now, this is a very basic example. It links to the project that we looked at right at the start. You can see this was for a radio system, which is going to record online radio statistics of listeners. So this is quite an easy one to identify because the main station, the main stakeholder is the radio station manager. He's the end user because the system is targeting the number of listeners so that he can assess that. So this is a really easy one and it's really easy to explain. You can see in here he's going to be using it to monitor on online, uh, on online statistics, online streaming so that he can report, run reports on them. 
But this could be explained much further to explain why he's the perfect stakeholder and how he's going to be using the system. It only briefly touches on how he's going to be using the system and this could be developed. Here's another example. Have a read through this and it is for a similar example to a game. You'll see in this example how they're talking about the age of the people and who exactly they've chosen. They have named stakeholders and explained very briefly why they've chosen, chosen them again. So you can see Sarah here is a tutor and has experienced working with small children in a classroom environment where they play educational games. Again, I think this needs more explanation. Why then is Sarah a good stakeholder? So now it's time to try and complete this section in your work. You need to make sure you clearly explain who your stakeholders are. So first of all, who is the user? What do they do? And what are their needs? You might talk about the role of the end user in an organisation. Make sure you explain why you've chosen these stakeholders, but also explain why this stakeholder is going to be interested in your system. So the next part is the project research. Make sure you have addressed the whole first three sections first before you move on to this. So in your project research, again, here's the mark scheme. You can see the nine to 10 mark band has the only different words justify and explain. You have to research the problem in depth, looking at existing solutions to similar problems, identifying and justifying suitable approaches based on your research. So you're gonna to have to research current problems or similar solutions and then justify your approach to the project based on this research. You'll have to identify the essential features of your solution and explain these choices. And then identify and explain with justification any limitations that you might face to your solution. And when you're talking about justification, explaining why and justifying that might be a limitation. This is a really important section and what I want you to do is read pages 27 to 31 and 36. While you do this, take notes about this section and make sure you have a clear understanding what you need to do. You may want to revisit this section as you move through this part of your project. Now this is a massively extended part of the project and it might take 10 to 20 pages of A4. It could include more. Again, there's no correct way of laying this out or format. It needs to be what information you think is important for this project and to get you the best marks. So I would start with a brief description of a current system if there is a current system. So if you've gone to a company and there's a current system which you're trying to improve, or there's a problem that you're trying to solve, you might start with what is the problem? Why is, is your stakeholder and the end user's needs not being met? What will your solution or your problem bring to the user and how will it help them? If you have a current solution, you might want to use a flowchart at this point to show how the current system works. Imagine you're going into a company and you've been tasked to make a new piece of software. You'd want to know the processes and the flow of what your project is going to do. Remember our waterfall model and our agile models. We're not just going to jump straight in to the project. Remember the waterfall model, you need to know exactly what the user wants before you start it because you're not going to go back to the start. We are using an agile model so we can adapt as we go along, but if we don't have an understanding of the end user needs, we're not going to be successful. You should be then highlighting the issues with the current system. What is it that needs to be solved? 
You might also want to include details and the ideas which you have which may solve the problem at this point. It's worth noting that you don't need a full solution here. You don't need all the answers. You're thinking about how you're going to go about this project and analysing current systems, uh, similar systems, their strengths, their weaknesses and how they might be improved on. You might want to do some form of questionnaire to question your stakeholder at this point and you can include that in an appendix at the end and you might want to do a summary of what you found out in this section. You might want interviews, you might want to do some observational reports where you go and observe somebody or observe a system or other similar systems and record your observations. When you record those, remember those key words, justification. You're justifying in your report exactly what you found and how that's going to impact the final product. You definitely need some form of conversation with your stakeholders for this section. And then finally, you're listing any limitations that you might have. That might be with technology. What your idea might have might not have the full technology that you might need. It might be that you're making part of a solution and that you're justifying why there might be limitations here. I recommend looking at similar projects. So have a look at the similar projects uh, that are out there so that you can see the structure and what they've included. The way you tackle this if you're making a game or if you're making a model or if you're doing some form of website is going to be totally different. And so you need to think carefully about what needs to be included in this section. There's a little table to help you uh, of things you might include in this section. Remember, it doesn't have to be included in here, uh, but these are some ideas. First of all, project planning guides such as Gantt charts, descriptions and timelines. You might have interview questions uh, and review of interviews that you've used, observations. You might include email correspondence. You might gather sample documents which show how a current system is working or screenshots of a current system. Again, you might have flowcharts, data flow diagrams, DFD diagrams. These show inputs and outputs of the current system. You might annotate documents or questionnaires to highlight points. You might then describe key problems or influences that you might uh, have in your system and you might have further research. Uh, this might be included in current systems, current features of systems and how you might make those better. Now you need to finish your investigation before you complete the requirements section of this project. It's important that you've done all your investigation before you do anything else. Now again, this is a very important part of your project. At the end, your evaluation and the marks linked to your evaluation will only be successful if you get your requirements correct. So first of all, read pages 32 to 33 of the book. You want to have a look at some of the examples in the book as well and keep these in mind while you're doing this. Here's the marks theme for this part. You need to have specified and justified the requirements for the solution. Now, when you're making success criteria, they need to be measurable. So you need to be able to show that you've met them. So keep that in mind when you are creating these. They need to be decomposed. That means you need to break them down into small sections. For example, if you have got a game and you've got a character in that game, you might want to have movement as one of the factors. You might want it to automatically move depending on where the user is going. You might want it to appear and disappear at certain points. Each of these could be a different success criteria, something slightly different that that character is doing. It is useful if you number them because then you can refer back to your success criteria throughout your project. Make sure while you're doing this, you justify each of your success criteria. I'd also recommend having a look at some other sample success criteria before you start doing this section. The final section of your report should be looking at the hardware and software that you need to complete this project. 
Make sure you've finished all sections of the project so far before you attempt this section. Then read page 35 of the book. In this section, you're going to have to complete the following. List any hardware that the end user will need, and you need to justify why that is needed. Any software that you're going to need, and at this point, you should have a clear understanding because of your research, the software that you're going to need to use in this project. Now that might be an IDE. It might be another piece of software that you're going to utilize. You need to make sure that you discuss all possible software solutions though. That might also include off the shelf products. So things that you could buy and then justify why your custom built software is the best solution. So think about it like this. Why would you use your solution rather than going to a shop and buying a different version that's already been made? If you're thinking about a game, why is your game going to be better than games that already exist? If you're making a website, think about why your website will be better and why it's best to use, let's say, for example, Google Chrome. Think about this very carefully and make sure you expand on your points.